Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Brownsville Matters. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and in the house today we have C. Styles, <laughs> Luis Robles, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you for having me. It sounds so normal compared to C. Styles. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I don't think a lot of people know my real name nowadays, but yeah, that's, that's what it is. But I go by C. Styles uh, when it comes to like social media and like you know the hip hop world. Mm-hmm. What is the difference between hip hop and rap? Is there a difference? Uh, there, the hip hop is the culture, and rap is what you do. You know, the music itself. So well, that's that's the most concise definition I've ever heard. I like <laughs> that. A, that so, straight to the point. <laughs> uh, so, so hip hop is the culture. It's the culture. Mm. I learned something just this morning. I, I, I looked it up. I didn't because my daughter was listening to uh, this song on on the way to to. I was taking her to school. She mm-hmm. listened to a song, TikTok radio, right? I looked it up because I thought that the word uh, was probably some code word for sex or (laughs) (laughs) something uh, like that. And then I looked it up, and it was actually the name of a singer from South Africa who uh, was known as Mother Africa, and they were celebrating her and her life as being an anti-apartheid activist uh, jazz singer from the the 50s. Oh, wow, okay. Um, Gosh, now I'm embarrassed. I can't think of the, the word hakiba or... Makiba, uh, Makiba. That's a. They say it over and over in the song Makiba, mm-hmm. and um, but her Makiba is the lady's real name. They were just you know putting a spin on how they said it oh, to okay. celebrate her. But that's what Makiba I thought was. Oh, it probably <laughs> means you know sex after cocaine or something really weird. But and, nowadays, uh, like, uh, uh, there's no shame in looking up whatever you uh, don't understand. Oh no, no, I, <laughs> I have to do it all the time. I'm, yeah. I'm a I'm a baby boomer, and I'm dealing with Generation Z and uh, all sorts of generations below me. So I'm aware I don't know their language, <laughs> and uh, so I need a lexicon. And so you know, you go look it up, and and, and you learn. Google is like two seconds away. <laughs> but I also like it because I get, uh, um, you know, like this one. This was a great education on one word. I, I had not heard of this woman before, and I, I actually lived in Africa for a while, way back. And oh, nice. uh, I had never heard of her, but uh, now I want to know more because she was very impressive. She even had a song that was aimed at getting um, Nelson Mandela released from prison. You know? So she was a, a, a great activist, internationally known, spoke at the UN, but mainly she arrived uh, to this uh, pinnacle of her career via jazz. So, so it was deeper than you thought. Then. Yeah, much, much <laughs> deeper, much, much deeper. Probably dissertations written on this woman, no doubt. So um, uh, do you have songs that are songs of activism in any way? I do, mm-hmm. uh, probably some of my old materi- material, um, you know, not many, uh, not mm-hmm. many. I don't really get too political when it comes to my, my songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more like personal and things that I go through in life and everything like that. Um, uh, for some reason, today's generation, they don't really go for political songs like they did mm-hmm. back then though. Uh, which is sad, you know, you should, you, sh- mm-hmm. you should know what's going on around the world and through music, you can connect the best way, you know, to people's, um, uh, minds and ears. So, well, you know, I grew up uh, in the 60s, and of course, the Vietnam War was going mm-hmm. on. It was a long, it was ancient history to most people. And I don't know that we were any different. I was listening to songs on the radio uh, that I just thought were good songs, but I didn't know until later that they were protest songs over the oh, war. Yeah. You know, like uh, Plenty of them. Creedence Clearwater Revival's uh, Who'll Stop the Rain. I just thought it was a song about Who'll Stop the Rain had a good melody. You know? yeah, 60s. And then I found out it was a war song, yeah, <laughs> an anti-war. Yeah, 60s was known for having a bunch of songs that had to deal with war and what was going yeah, on around the yeah, country. Yeah. Um, also, that one song that goes, who... Ah, what is it good for? Yes, that, yes, that's, that's a war that, song. That's exactly, <laughs> yes, yeah. Classic from that time. And, of course, Woodstock was full of anti-war, yeah, so yeah, yeah. the classic thing. So I guess it doesn't hurt there. There's an audience that will know what you're doing, mm-hmm. and then there's the audience who just think it's good music. <laughs> so they may yeah. not connect until, until later. How did you get started? Um, I've been around the hip-hop culture since I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in Chicago. Well, before we get to Chicago, I was born in Guadalajara, Mexico. Oh. So I was born there, but at three years old, um, my, mm-hmm. my dad moved us over there to Chicago. And that's where, like, I was inspired by everything. So and you don't you don't really have much memory of Guadalajara because you were three years old. Well, you I might got, have a little bit. I got a pretty good photogenic memory. I mean, uh-huh. I remember, <laughs> I do remember being 
there at three uh-huh. and getting on the plane to go to Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a big I, moment. I, I, so I do remember you that. Hold on to that. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, I mean, I really didn't do much because I, I was barely starting my life. <laughs> now, were you in the south side of Chicago? No, north no? side. North side. North side. Of Isn't Chicago. the south side known as the uh, Hispanic side, or am I wrong? I, I really, I, I've always uh, connected they do, it. They do have a, a Hispanic side. It's mm-hmm. on like mostly on Twenty Sixth Street. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, no, the Hispanics are all over the, the city. It's all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> all over the <laughs> it's place. Everywhere. Is it, yeah. Chicago's about fifty percent Hispanic. I, I think that's a fair assessment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because like you know they got also a big Polish community as well. Mm-hmm. So I mean. Yeah, you could say it's about fifty percent Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Well, it's yeah. a, it's an incredibly multi ethnic city. Yeah. You, have, you have the whole world is there. <laughs> Basically, yeah, you know, you have all types of cultures there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I would I would say yeah. It's a. It's have you a, seen by chance the show The Bear? No, I it's, haven't actually. Uh, no. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I've heard of yeah, it, but I, you, you should watch it because I mean it, it's kind of like visual hip hop. Mm-hmm. It, it is it is fast moving. It is frenetic. It's in a it's in a kitchen in Chicago. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy's. Uh, uh, opening, uh, trying to open a really high class restaurant from the neighborhood of his youth. Oh, okay. And so he's trying to convert these people that kind of he grew up with into uh, being classy chefs. <laughs> but it, but it's just real frenetic in its pacing, and so it's a lot to me like uh, uh, you know, like visual hip hop. It's moving, it's moving rapidly and quickly, and the conversations are over on top of each other, and you have to really pay attention. I've never seen TV quite like this. So you, you is, been is from Chicago. Uh, um, I, I think I saw it on uh, Netflix, but Netflix. I really can't remember where I, where I picked it up, but you, you can find it. it, it yeah, well, I was thinking about like, is it on like in a streaming platform like Hulu? Yeah, yeah like it's Paramount? on something like that. I just, I can't recall. Like that's my problem these days. I don't, I remember seeing it, but I don't know if it's on Apple TV. <laughs> I don't know where it is on all these different and they, they platforms. They got too many, too many streaming sites nowadays. Yeah. Like, you, know, uh, you, yes. you don't know, you can't keep but, up with anything. But, but I think given, you know, your artistic mm-hmm. sensibilities and being from Chicago, I, I don't think it's any way you couldn't love this, the show. Oh yeah, so, I'll, I'll get in. So do you, so, but anyway, you grew up in Chicago, mm-hmm. and at what age did you start, thing, you know, enjoying or singing or trying uh, your chops at hip hop? I would say like at around ten years old. Mm-hmm. At around ten, I was like really interested in hip hop, and it was all around us. Uh, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't escape it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, I would be there at my desk writing different kinds of rhymes and you know just simple stuff. And it wasn't until I was like around 13 where I had a friend that pushed me into a talent show with him because he was nervous and he wrote like some of my rhymes and stuff like that. You know, he's like, come on, you know, come on stage with me. Like, you know, you know, when you get closer to the show, you start getting these butterflies inside you and you're just Mm -hmm. like, oh, I want somebody next to me now. So he he had me learn this in math class and I had like two periods to learn it until the show was there. And of course, when it came time to to perform, it, it was a debacle. And <laughs> you know, I just like, you know, I couldn't remember anything because you, you your mind needs at least a few days to remember something. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, you know, when you're a little kid, you don't you don't know this stuff. And uh, but then being on stage, it kind of like gave me like a sense of freedom. I guess mm-hmm. you know, I was you said, like, I like this. I like this, even though <laughs> it was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, like I I got into that, and then. Um, it wasn't until high school where I kind of like took it more serious. So I would say around that, but 13, 13 years old was like, kind of like me dipping my toes in the, in the water and just finding out for myself, you know, what I like and what I don't like. So I would say that. Where did you first get to perform publicly? Did you go to uh, like a a nightclub or, or was there a neighborhood concert Uh, where you got to perform? It wasn't until I came to Brownsville where they had this uh, teen night club and uh, they allowed me and a couple of friends to perform there. And that was the first time I performed in front of, uh, I guess you could say, a fairly amount of large amount of people. And um, at that time, I was like, oh, OK, well, you know, this is awesome. This uh-huh. is cool, you know. And then from there on, you know, you, you would so just. So was your first time reasonably successful? Must have been or you wouldn't have said, I like this and I want to do this. Yeah, more. because. Um, the, the whole crowd was feeling it, you know. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there were a bunch of teens. So like sure. <laughs> yeah. did, did, were you doing your own stuff or were you doing uh, covers? No, at that time, I, I was doing my own stuff. Oh. I was doing songs that I've written. And uh, like I said, you know, I still wasn't 
a seasoned performer, if you would like to say that. Um, but at this, you know, I don't, I, I didn't even record it either, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't know what mistakes I made back then. But I like the the thrill of it. So, and are your songs, um, like you said, based on your experience in life? Yes, uh, autobiographical. Based on my experiences, sometimes they're uh, braggadocio, because mm-hmm. you know, that's what hip hop is. Sometimes you know, like there's a thing called you know just you know spitting bars, which is like try to come up with the most, I guess, creative uh, ways to put words together. And uh, for the most part, you know, that's cool and everything, but, it, you know, what separates a good rapper from just an average rapper is the content you put into your lyrics. Mm-hmm. So basically, if you're talking about something, you're resonating with somebody, then you're on a different level. Then, you know, you start actually being considered or respected more. Um, like I said, today, today's culture, today's world is like a little bit different than the one that I grew up in. Mm-hmm. You know, back then, you, you really had to, like, uh, compete with everybody else to, like, you know, write the best lyrics. Uh, everything was focused on the writing process. Um, you had to say something. And I feel like today's, uh, I guess you could say, today's hip hop culture, it took a step back a little bit, you know. You know, someone from my age group, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you hear this a lot, it, it sounds to me like they're just competing to who can be the nastiest, <laughs> you know, who can be the most pornographic. And, <laughs> And uh, and I know for that culture, uh, it doesn't hit them the way it hits me mm-hmm. from my generation. It's um, they may be using a word I'm familiar with, but to them it's a different word. It doesn't have the same uh, negative connotation of nastiness, you might mm-hmm. say. So mm-hmm. I'm aware that I come from a different world, and I try, actually try that was to a term dispensation that, that was a term described back in the '90s. Like if you were that great, you know. N- nasty and like you're nasty like a, a nasty lyricist or something like that uh-huh. because like uh one of the greatest rappers he started off with the name nasty nas <laughs> well now he goes by nas but it used to be nasty nas so uh-huh. that that was a term at that time it could be nasty <laughs> ill you know like sick <laughs> and, and who were your early heroes in the in the genre oh definitely uh biggie uh snoop uh, Tupac. I mean, yeah. oh, I was reading name, name, names that you've heard of. <laughs> that's what I, I grew reading, up on. I was reading an article <laughs> yesterday about mm-hmm. Tupac, and I wasn't doing that because of this. I just stumbled across it, and I found it interesting. They're talking about uh, how he was uh, a, a guy of enormous contradictions, which is often true of great artists. You know, oh, they, yeah. they, have, they have enormous contradictions. They said on the one he had he had lyrics that were very edgy and. Um, and, and kind of brutal at mm-hmm. some level, uh, but he was exceptionally kind to women and, uh, and protected them, so to speak. He, he, he covered for them and sympathized and empathized with their um, unique lives that are sometimes harsh and difficult. And so they found that a little, they were saying that's, that's a contradiction between this guy on the one hand mm-hmm. that you think is gonna be unempathetic yeah. and yet he's very empathetic. As they said, that's part of the, his enduring legacy is that, uh, like you said, he wrote brilliantly, mm-hmm. and th- those that brilliant content holds up. Well, he was also a Gemini, so mm-hmm. that's where all the passion and contradictory comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, but also back then, there was no social media, so there was nobody to really call him out and be like, oh, you're being a hypocrite. Actually, back then, you know, it was kind of like allowed to be. Uh, hypocritical mm-hmm. you know because that's how we are as humans you know we we are hypocrites mm-hmm. normally you know like but in today's world we got to seem like we're like perfect you know we got to mm-hmm. be one way and if we switch it up then all of a sudden people are like are alienated to it and they're like oh my god well he used to be like this and now he's like that and like you know pe- people change like and, and, and people are fast thinkers you know like <laughs> uh-huh. it's not an acceptable thing nowadays but it is you know being hypocritical is part of human nature i heard the other day that uh, um there was a uh, a football player, a, you know, a great football player from San Francisco, who uh, whose son is a rapper, right? Mm-hmm. And he kind of um, threw his son under the bus, perhaps accidentally. Oh, Michael Irvin? Uh, yeah. Uh, is it Michael Irvin? Yeah, my, Michael Irvin was talking about that. Uh, well, he, he's an analyst now, but he used to play for the Cowboys. Right, right. Michael Irvin. Oh, well, I was thinking, <laughs> of, I was thinking of San Francisco for some reason. But oh, it was, the game, it was at the game that he said that. Where he, he said, you, you grew up in a gated community. <laughs> I mean, what do you know about the ghetto life? And, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. So well, he, I mean, he lost his street cred, man. <laughs> <laughs> he had to uh, hold him accountable for that. Yeah. You know, sometimes if you're, because he comes from a, from the same era I come in, mm-hmm. um, which is you got to be as real as you can be. You yeah. know. And do then, you have street cred? 
<laughs> I might have a little bit. I might have that uh, equivalent to a 325 credit score. <laughs> but I did I did I did grow up, you know, like in a rough area or at least not that rough, no, but no, mm. but you know like I wasn't as uh well off as, you know, I was when I came to Brownsville. Uh -huh. Because like I said like a quick story just to like, you know, give it context. Uh my dad was a uh, food inspector at the time and he was studying, you know, to be a doctor. Mm. And by the time when we moved here, that's when he established himself. So at that time, we didn't have much. But by the time I, mm. we came over here, my lifestyle changed completely. Mm. So it was like, you know, kind of like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, if you ever seen that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, you go from one yeah. area to another, and it's mm -hmm. completely different. And you just, you know, you kind of got to get used to it. You know, granted, I got used to it quick, but... <laughs> 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 yeah like that's what people like seem to like not understand about me when it comes to you know in the hip-hop world people always mm -hmm. thought that you know i was always like wealthy or whatever or or, or well off you mm -hmm. know and they didn't start like that and this is why you kind of have like the best of both worlds with me you know at mm -hmm. the time when i moved over here you know like i, I was a completely different person right i was a uh, you know i dressed baggy you know i was like the way I talk was, you know, foreign to people. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know, why, why, you know, why does he talk like that or whatever? And uh, at the time, I didn't understand, like, you know, why people would look at me different. And they would ask my dad, like, you know, well, why is your son dressing like that? Da, 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 da. Well, you know, he just came from Chicago. He just moved <laughs> to Brownsville. He has a different, completely lifestyle. Let him get adjusted to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm a teen at the time too, so <laughs> <laughs> it was a completely, you know, different world. But by the time my dad, you know, when we moved over here. You know, he was hanging amongst, you know, some elite company, you know, for lack of sure. better words. Yeah. And when they see their, like his son like that, they're like, well, why is he like that? Why does he act like that? Well, this is where, this we, is where, where he come from. come from, you know. His roots. Well, I would imagine, though, that you came from Chicago into Brownsville. In some way, that would be, uh, that would make you cool, you know, that you've been to the big city. You've been to oh, the big to, culture. To the girls, it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the girls, they like that. <laughs> At that time, yeah, yeah, when I went to high school, I had no problem talking to <laughs> girls, you know, yeah. or they coming up to to me at that time. But besides that, it was still an adjustment, you know. Mm -hmm. It was you know, from a big city to a small town, because at that time it was a uh, what was it year two thousand. It's completely different than what it, it is today. Sure, <laughs> you know. So at oh, that at that time, there was no place for teens to do anything, right? So. It was just like a culture shock. It was like, oh, wow, like, what do I do here? Like, you know, and uh, at the same time, uh, pe some people don't know this, but I, I went to therapy because, uh, you know, I was just like, I fell into depression a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, as the a couple of years went by. And um, my mom, like, she kind of panicked, didn't want her son to do anything crazy. So she uh, sent me to therapy. And, um, you know, after that, I started getting adjusted to Brownsville. It wasn't until I, I was like kind of like 19 where I was like, okay, I appreciated what it, what it was down here, the, you know, the culture here. Yeah. I think when you move as a kid to a new place, you, you only see what's not here. Mm -hmm. You know, you see what's missing and yeah. it bothers you. Plus you probably gave up a great network of friends. Yeah, that too. Um, you know, I, I gave up friends that I grew up with, but I also, I also made friends here. I also make mm -hmm, friends sure. here that, that are still my friends today. Um, that's the positive uh, point of being here is that, you know, you make lifelong friends. Do you, do you perform uh, here in the Valley? Yeah, I perf perform in McAllen. Mm -hmm. uh, I perform in Brownsville a few times. Uh, where else? Edinburgh, uh, South Padre, mm -hmm. you know, mostly South Padre. And then we go, you go to Houston, San Antonio. I've done those two. Uh, even back home in Chicago, I mm -hmm. performed there too. That must have been fun. Yeah, it go was. Back, <laughs> it actually home. was. Yeah, yeah. I said, look, but man, he's. It, it was a full circle moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it, is there a place at the island that is uh, you kind of a, a hip hop sort of venue that that's that's what they do? You know, just like you have country western bars. So yeah. Do they have a place that's that? Well, I perform at Clayton's, oh, where, Clayton's, where, where okay. I've opened up for a uh, big name artist. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you know, like uh, Clayton's was one of them. Uh, well, it still oh, and is. They, and they have a, a, a huge, what sometimes in the spring break, 2,000 people. They have a yeah, huge, yeah. Huge audience, the, the, right? The spring break uh, shows what I've been doing. Uh, that, that was a, that make you really nervous to have the, that big a crowd? 
actually, uh, like, I prefer bigger crowds than yeah. small, small, intimate yeah. ones. Because when there's a bigger crowd, like, your mind kind of cancels out because there's so many faces. It's like your brain doesn't register that there's people out there. So you just see a bunch of, you know, blank stares and all that. <laughs> As opposed to, like, when you're in an intimate setting, you know, there, you, you can see people's eyes. You can see who's focused on you. So it kind of mm-hmm. it, it's more intimidating. But when there's, like, a sea of crowd and everything like that, you're just, like, there's more room for error, actually. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> so, you know, because it's louder. It's, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the and sound they're dr- system. But they're might, drinking, right? Yeah, and they're drinking, that, too. That's helpful, isn't that's, it? That's also helpful. Uh, that's, gonna... that's also helpful. And the thing about it is they're not more focused on how great you do your lyrics. They're more focused on how much they you could uh, have control over the crowd. You know, how much it could make, make them feel good, I guess. So and, what is the secret there? Of, of working the crowd what what do you know about that um but basically it has to be like mostly fast paced uh, you know a lot of uh, interaction you know a lot of interaction a lot of throwing free stuff people like free things <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um you know come with a when you interact don't don't be talking for you know for more than like about 10 seconds uh the songs have to be at least a minute and a half so that way they don't get bored, you know, with the entire setting, especially if they don't really know you like that. And do you go in with a, a set, here's 10 songs I'm going to do? Do you have, do you know what you're well, going to in, do? Well, in, 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 in the hip-hop world, you know, and if you're opening for somebody, they usually give you like 15 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So basically that, that's perfect. That's perfect, you know, so that way you don't get the crowd all, you know, rusty and start, you know, being restless and everything like that. So it's a kind of like, you know, a fast paced thing. You go from one and my, mm-hmm. my formula was always like, you know, do one, one of my songs, uh, do a verse over a famous beat, mm-hmm. something that they're familiar with. Yeah. And then, you know, interact with them in the middle of that and then go back to one of your songs and do another famous beat and then go back to another one of your songs. And then within that, you'll fill in the 15 minutes in their minds. It was just like five minutes and they had a good time. I'm finding it interesting how these um, modern um, hip hop artists mm-hmm. often sample uh, songs from the 60s and 70s, and then they they kind of I don't know what you call it stitch into it using the beat. And oh. I'm just wondering about the copyright. I mean, <laughs> no, how do sampling. they pick up these these old songs and then and then do a song around it, which is cool. I mean, I like it. I, I think mm-hmm. it's, it's fine. There's one right now called "Paint the Town Red," <laughs> and uh, it it starts off with an old Supreme song yeah. and, and samples it. So I'm just curious, how, how do they deal with the copyright on that sort of oh. thing? They just pay it. Let me go into the context of it. Okay. Like sampling, you know, for people that aren't familiar with it, uh, it's a it's a form of art, actually. Mm-hmm. Oh, I because it. yes, I, I, because the 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 premier producers and I'm 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 gonna tell you this much like in the '90s, producers were competing with each other to make you know the flip the best samples right, mm-hmm. and sampling usually takes where you're digging into the crates right, which means you go to the record store and get the most obscure uh, song that mm-hmm. nobody really has heard of, okay, and take that and you know chop it up and flip it into something brand new. You know, that, that's a premier producer, somebody that takes everything and makes the sample unrecognizable. Now, the ones that do make the, the samples recognizable, I guess that's just for commercial purposes to get, you know, uh, to cross over to different crowds that aren't really familiar with hip hop and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's why you'll hear something like uh, when they sample uh, Mike, Mike McDonald, I think his name is. Uh, the, the song, they don't love you no more. Uh, well, I know uh, Warren G sampled that for regulators, mm-hmm. you know, just hit the east side of the LBC. Well, you know, he sampled that. That's a famous sample. Mm-hmm. And I think he did it for commercial purposes. So that way, you know, they could blow up with a hit. Mm-hmm. But, the, but, but going back to that, you know, sampling the best producers take all these type of, you know, sounds and make it into, you know, their own song. And that's a premiere flip of a sample. Yeah, it's always slightly, slightly different. I mean, mm-hmm. it isn't exactly what was before. Uh-huh. They, they've uh, uh, re-engineered it in some way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find it interesting. I'm, but my curiosity really is about the copyright. Okay, so that, going back to copyright. they got to pay the copyright okay. somewhere, I'm sure. So when you sample somebody, uh, the label has to uh, clear the sample from the original composer. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be the artist, the original artist, because, mm-hmm. you know, a certain label, their label probably owns the rights. Whoever right. owns the masters to the to that original song mm-hmm. is the one you have to call, and they have to clear that sample. And of course, it, it might be you know a certain price. They might want a percentage of it, right? 
like so let's say like you know they might be uh lenient and want 25 percent of the song mm. or they could be kind of evil <laughs> i don't want to use another term for it right. but uh uh they and and say you know what i want 100 percent of the song mm. like what they did with puff daddy for i'll be missing you mm. You ever heard that song, which sampled the the police? Uh, every every breath you take. Yes, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so he sampled that, and then when uh, when Sting, you know, when he got to talk to Sting, Sting wanted one hundred percent of everything. Oh, 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 oh. That and, sounds like Sting. He has a reputation. And Puffy mm -hmm. was like, "Well, that was kind of like a good investment because that was his biggest song, and from there it took him to like you know to other different things. different levels." Mm -hmm. yeah, there's one right now. The uh, to Ice Ice Baby, mm -hmm. it's they've sampled that. And, yeah, uh, um, from Queen. Bops, Bops going brazy or something. Oh yeah, Tiger. He, 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 he sampled that. Okay. Yeah, and then, but but it's really the whole song. The whole thing is based on that track. Yeah, and uh, and it's good. But mm -hmm. uh, like you say, you take a beat that is familiar. I, mm -hmm. I heard one guy explain it like this. He said, you take a railroad track that's already going into the mm -hmm. mind, and you put a new thing on it, and it goes in easy. Because they already have the track; it's already there. It, it goes, and it's familiar well, they're, they're and likable. Take, they're not taking the completely original one, though. Right, they're, right. they're taking they, that and putting been, drums under it, yeah, and putting you know mm. the filter, bass, or whatever mm. it is that you know. That's why it's called a sample. You're taking mm. a little piece of it, and then you're constructing around it, which is its own uh -huh. creative uh -huh. enterprise. And so I, I'm with you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I just haven't seen it done before. It used to be that the songs were simply covered, mm -hmm. you know, like if someone would take a song from the 60s, like uh, uh, ZZ. Oh, there's a difference between that. Uh, yeah, like um, it was Creedence Clearwater Revival yeah. who took the song, I heard it through the grapevine, and I like their version, their cover, mm -hmm. better than the original by Marvin Gaye, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may be that I heard it first from them that made it that, uh, that way. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a different thing. But I'm just saying, as a guy from my generation, a baby yeah. boomer, I hear this. I, I didn't think that they were stealing. Uh -huh. I just thought, how do they pay the copyright? Yeah, that, well, <laughs> there you go. There's different ways of it. Depends yeah. on who you're sampling. Sure. Uh, now, yeah, now, because have, have you had the experience? It's often true that many bands have gotten their, or, or artists have gotten their start in life because they introduced or they you know, they opened for a better act or a better known act mm -hmm. and then they did a better job than the than the act itself and that then they develop a name for themselves and become and then they become the act over time <laughs> so have you had that experience somewhere where people say you know i i liked you better than the guy you opened for yeah actually i have mm -hmm. um that didn't take me to different levels, but I mean, I've had people tell me like, well, I, I liked you better than. It's great uh, encouragement. You know? Yeah, it's great encouragement. It's mm -hmm. good e ego boost. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you always uh, go back and like, you know, it, there's a saying like, you know, if you're the type that, uh, let me see, how, how was that quote? Like if you, if you could, if you can't take uh, criticism, then there's no reason you should be taking uh, compliments or something like that. I don't well, know how to quote No, that's it, good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, but if, if you can't you, take the criticism, you shouldn't yeah, take the compliments. Yeah, yeah. No. But uh, you got to handle both. So the way I handle it is like you know, even the people tell me like, oh, it was good or whatever. You know, I still find different ways to like improve. Yeah. Basically, keep your feet on the ground. Keep your feet on the ground. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm always yeah. looking for different ways to to be better or do something. Mm -hmm. to, to, to this day, you know, like I I don't I don't stay uh, content with what I have. Where, where where do you go from here? What's your your next step? I mean, you've you've done a lot of performing in the valley mm -hmm. and open for big names. Where do you go? Now I'm collaborating with uh, big names. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not performing as much as I used to. Now, because, uh, like I said, social media has taken over TikTok. You know, they make it easy to reach way more people than mm -hmm. what you could. Um, Are you on TikTok? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's where I have, like, my most audience. Uh, uh, okay. What's, what is your – oh, yes, uh, I think Gabriel was telling uh, me you have, like, 200,000 followers on, on your TikTok. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that came uh, from the pandemic. Uh -huh. The pandemic is what helped me out, and um, it just blew up because of, you know, my story. Mm -hmm. uh, TikTok has a lot of – uh, young kids there, or I'm, I'm not gonna say kid kids, but like teenagers. Sure. And uh, I guess they like the story of how I was raising my my two uh, kids. You know, they're my step kids. Um, and it's also intriguing because one of my kids has a deep voice, and uh, I'm pretty good at creating stories. So the way I do my uh, format of content is I do one minute one minute stories. So when I tell a story, you know, I involve you know pretty pretty good amount of detail. And that's how it captures people 
to my page and stuff like that. And also, like it also, like I said, it also helped that you know my son he had, he developed a deep voice at thirteen. <laughs> That's and, unusual. And we started, you know, uh, yeah, um, we started focusing on the journey of him becoming a rapper because he wanted to become a rapper mm -hmm. and he fit in there like a glove, like naturally yes. <laughs> because his voice helped a lot. So. Yeah. So, so it what, what is your um, your TikTok handle or, or your page? Oh yeah. How do we find you? Yeah, Chicago Styles twenty three, basically. Oh, I like uh, that. Or it's easy just, to remember. So Chicago Styles twenty three. Yeah, or you can put your C Styles and you'll see my picture like pop up, and that's where that's it is. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot for coming in. I'm, I'm oh, enjoyed talking you. to you. Thank this you. This so is much. a whole genre I, I really know nothing about. I just happen to know a, a couple of things, primarily because my daughter mm -hmm. listens to the TikTok radio, <laughs> <laughs> so so I've gotten a little exposure. But I've always huh. had a great appreciation uh, for uh, different art forms and the creativity it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when I was uh, much younger. And uh, everybody was talking about um, Eminem. People were like, and I just kind of ignored him. And, and somebody said, he has brilliant lyrics. You should listen to him as a mm -hmm. person who likes good writing. Listen. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I did. And I kind of appreciated him the way that you were talking about Tupac or, mm -hmm. and others. That the writing is the magic. And uh, it's the it's the thing that tells you that it has universality and it has permanence. It's in, in the clarity and beauty of the words and then the uh, the style animates it yeah, and brings it to life. So, uh -huh. so I appreciate what you're doing. I'm going to check out your page. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Go, uh -huh. go for it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank Good you so you. much. Thank you. Thanks for watching this BSPA video. Go ahead and hit like and subscribe if you like what you see. And if you really like what you see, go ahead and go to our website brosoperformingarts.org and smash the donate button and then we'll really like you too.